Christ Journey family, I am happy to welcome you as we gather once again and remember that this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Gables Campus, Kendall Campus, wherever you're making your connection with us today, we are praying God's blessing for you and remembering this, nothing is too hard for God. Did you know there are three questions that every growing believer must seek to answer when engaging the Bible. What does it say? What does it mean? What do I do? The question of observation, what does it say? The question of interpretation, what does it mean? And the question of application, now, what do I do? Now what that means is that we don't just read and study the Bible for information's sake, to enlarge our capacity for knowledge, we read it for transformation, life transformation. In fact, the scripture tells us that it is God-breathed. It has the life and breath of God in it. So it's inspired as no other document in world history. It's dynamic, it's living, it's active. How do I know that? Well, one way is that it's like a double-edged sword that can penetrate to the deepest parts of the human soul and spirit, judging the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So I pray that, I know many of you pray that with me, that every time that we open God's word, he would open our understanding to a deeper realization of who he is. And then what to do. But you know what? To do that, you need to know what? You need to know what does it say, what does it mean, and then what do I do? To know what it says, we read it and we hear it. And we've been doing that every time we gather in the book of Revelation. But that doesn't immediately help us know what does it mean, right? I mean, you've been hearing, what does it say? Yeah, but what does it mean? No, for that, we need interpretation. Some level of understanding about what? is he talking about before we try to jump to a decision about now what should I do? In Acts chapter eight, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading a passage from the book of Isaiah and Philip, a follower of Christ, says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy's response is what? No, how can I unless someone explains it to me? Now, I'm thinking if that's true about Isaiah, then how much more true is it about Revelation? Reading this is a challenge. Has it been to you? I mean, through the weeks that we've been doing this? Yeah, well, interpreting it takes it to a whole other level. And so something else that growing disciples learn, context. Context has much to do with getting the intended meaning of the Bible. Like grammatical context, what do the words mean in the sentence, in the paragraph, in the book? You know, we don't just lift them out of their context. And then what did they mean in the original setting and language, the original context that it came from? And then there's the literary context. What type of literature is this? Is it letter? Is it poetry? Is it law? Is it history? Revelation, we have seen, is a unique type of literature literature. It's known as apocalyptic, which means that it uses words as symbolic image full of shock and awe to uh, impact so that you feel this visceral impact in reading and trying to imagine what is this. But it's not typically intended to be taken in a literal way. Apocalyptic was not written for literal physicality. That's part of what makes Revelation so challenging, even for Bible scholars, people who dedicate their lives to this, who study these things deeply and yet find themselves landing in different conclusions about certain texts. So I'm saying that to say this, there is mystery. There is mystery here that requires humility of us not dogmatism. 
Uh, I mentioned early on that there are a variety of approaches to try to interpret the symbols, interpreting. We see what it says, but what does it mean? We're trying to interpret the symbols and the message of Revelation. Some, some scholars see it making the greatest amount of sense to people in the first century who were experiencing the crushing persecution of the Roman Empire. Others see it defining the course of human nature all across human history, but not always speaking specifically to people, places, and events in predicting it through its imagery. So you can see the difference there. And then some see it only making sense to what they call the final generation, which means that generation that began, uh, an era, a generation that began in 1948 when Israel became a modern nation. And then some see it as a combination of these, not unaware of each other, but gleaning from all of those to receive the blessing that's promised there. I believe, you're wonder, I don't know if you're wondering, but here's what I believe. I believe that Revelation had deep and real meaning in the culture and the context in which it was first received. But I also believe that it speaks with clarity and arresting um, intentionality to what human nature has been like all across the, the decades, centuries, and millennia since Christ came. And I believe it forms a framework as a countdown to that great day of accountability that the prophets and the apostles predicted would be coming at the end of the age. I don't believe that it was written to be some kind of sanctified crystal ball, that we can look into the crystal ball and see specifically the pieces of the puzzle coming neatly together where the headlines of today's paper wrap right into what that image meant and has always meant for all of time. So when I hear people speaking about names, and you know, trying to name names and nations from the symbolic images and the events in the Revelation, it makes me hesitant. I, I'm not immediately resistant but I am hesitant. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm a dynamic. I believe that God dynamically applied his word in the first century across every century for those that seek him and is speaking with clarity to the final days of human history. But I'm hesitant. It's not that I don't believe current events are not confirming the truth of scripture. It's that I just want to be careful not to do eisegesis. I want to do exegesis of scripture. Now, if those words are new to you, exegesis means bringing out of Scripture that which is actually there. Eisegesis means putting into Scripture ideas that are not there and adding to the Bible things that are not intended or actually embedded in the text, which is challenging with the Revelation. Like what? Well, like who Gog and Magog are. Revelation doesn't tell us that. Who the Antichrist is, by name, it's not in there. Who the beasts are, what the mark of the beast is, and as if a microchip could be inserted into your body, and that's the mark of the beast. The Revelation doesn't say that. Does the, does the book of Revelation require that a literal temple re, be rebuilt in Jerusalem before Jesus can come again? See, there is a viewpoint that believes, yes, the temple's got to be rebuilt before Jesus can come. I don't believe that. I think that Jesus could come any day now and translate the bodies of believers for eternity in midair. <laughs> and could I be wrong? Yes. Yes. And so could those who hold the other viewpoints, which is why this is a mystery that requires humility. That's what I'm saying, but here's the heart of what I believe. God is not bound to a human interpretation of his word. Just because some human interpreter says it means something doesn't mean God says, oh, I'll do it that way. You understand what I'm saying? I want to honor the God of the revelation, 
not just somebody's interpretation of it. So here's the thing. We do our best, and I do too, and I'm under scrutiny and accountability for how I understand this. But we do our best to understand and explain the meaning of God's word in Jesus Christ, but even our best efforts are limited. Limited knowledge. And that's the mystery, part of it, that brings humility. The doctor's degree that I have from Southwestern Seminary, is in the field of hermeneutics. That means the science of interpretation, the science of biblical interpretation. That's what my study is in. Now, I am not a Hebrew or a Greek scholar, but I will tell you, I regularly use the Hebrew and Greek lexicon in my daily studies. And all that's happened there for me, and terms of greater understanding is that I have a greater affirmation that the Bible is God's inspired word to the human race, deserves our attention, and the scriptures, here's what they say about themselves, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And today's message from Revelation 15 and 16 pouring out the bowls of wrath help us understand why we need salvation in Jesus Christ. Because God indeed will one day pour out the third and final series of judgments upon the earth to bring down the world system of rebellion and evil, to return triumphantly in the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ to judge the living and the dead and then to initiate the eternal destinies as he taught and as we were told. So may I invite you to join me now as together we hear as I read from Revelation chapter 15 and 16. Wherever you're joining us, whatever campus you're on, let's stand together right there in your own living room. Would you stand in the presence of God as we hear his word from Revelation 15? I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Seven angels with the last seven plagues. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast, its image, and over the number of its name. And they held harps that God had given them and sang a song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord? And bring glory to your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And after this, I looked. And uh, in heaven, the temple, that is the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. And out of the temple came seven angels with the seven plagues. And they were dressed in clean, shining linen, and they wore golden sashes around their chests. And then one of the living creatures gave to the seven angels and the seven bowls uh, filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. And then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land and ugly and painful sores broke out on people who had the mark of the beast and they worshiped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea And it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. 
The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire, and they were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent or glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl On the throne of the beast, and the kingdom was plunged into darkness. And men gnawed on their tongues in agony, and they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. But they refused to repent of what they had done. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, And its water dried up to prepare way for the kings from the east. And then I saw three evil spirits. They looked like frogs that came out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world and gather them for the battle on that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. And then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. And then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. And the great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of of his wrath. Every island fled away. The mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. Please be seated. See what I mean about mystery? Oh my goodness. What does it say? But what does it mean? We've heard what is what the bowls of wrath. The bowls of wrath are the third in a series of seven judgments that we have seen roll out in the Revelation. The seven seals were the first, affecting one fourth of the earth, it said. The seven uh, trumpets then came and impacted one third more. And now in the seven bowls of wrath, as they're poured out, The entire earth is being affected. So you can see the incremental expression of that. All living things, every water supply, all natural life, and then upon the air, the realm of supernatural opposition to God's rule. And then what happens? Well, the unholy trinity, we were introduced to them last time, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, unleash demon forces compelling the governments of the world to all gather together for battle, the battle of Armageddon. Maybe you've heard that phrase before, where sinful people will unite to fight God in a final act of rebellion, a final show of rebellion. They're unwilling to turn, unwilling to change, cursing the God of heaven and refusing to repent. It's a sad and horrible picture. This is what I see in it, of the ravages of sin on human life. It's deceitfulness and utter destruction Of human life. This is what it looks like when sin, our sin finds us out. See, when the Bible says our sin finds us out, it doesn't mean you're going to be caught 
doing it. It means that it will catch you in the doing. That it brings its own snag into our lives and leaves us naked, leaves us exposed, leaves us blinded, and binds us. And here's the thing. You don't even realize it when it's happening. Like spiritual cataracts that steal the light from our eyes gradually over time. So sin works like that. Like the proverbial frog in the kettle. It's said that if a frog is suddenly put into boiling water, it will immediately jump out. But if it's put into tepid water and then gradually brought to a boil, it will not perceive the danger and stay and be cooked to death. It's an image going on here. Samuel Johnson said it this way, the chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. The series of judgments have come each one of them with warnings, with opportunities for turning, and yet at every point, the people refuse to repent. And especially in this one, the final series, he says time and again and again. It's like, you know, these judgments are like those of Moses. Those of you who remember the story of Moses trying to get God's people out of Egyptian slavery and into freedom, set them free against Pharaoh. You heard similar pronouncements made. And the curses of the judgments came to set people's free, set God's people free. But what was exposed at the same time? The hardness of Pharaoh's heart. And so once again, we're seeing it here. Now, hardness is having its way, and rebellion and resistance against God is having its way. Only now, the entire world, apart from Christ, is like Pharaoh getting hard and harder with every plague that God shows each judgment has come with a greater impact, a greater scope, a greater depth, a greater volume. In other words, the cancer of sin has metastasized to every level. It's gone all the way deep. And like chemotherapy, Justice is going after each and every bit of cancer in human culture. Showing us clearly that the wages of sin is death. This is how it happens. If you refuse the gift of God in Jesus Christ, there's no other way out. That's what John is trying to show. And so that means the, hey, don't judge me, bro. That approach is kind of like refusing correction in class until the day of the final. And then you fail the test because you weren't ready. Because you weren't paying attention all along the way. And some of you remember that he started by saying there's a blessing here for us. If we hear it and read it and, you know, take it to heart, okay, where's the blessing? I'm wondering when I'm reading this, and here's what came to me. Preparation before the final is the blessing. If you're wondering what does all this have to do with me, then I would say the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. That's that's where the blessing is. Christianity is not an escapist consumer faith. It is a be ready faith, a be prepared faith. And it's telling us clearly that human sin in human history cannot and will not go on forever. God will not let it. There is coming a day. And the storm system, John says, the visions are right here. The storm systems have already formed and they're already active and it's already taking place with Cat 5 plus hurricane damage in its force. And so the time for storm preparedness is when? Before the storm. It's now. That's what he's trying to say. Jesus sounds the alarm. Right there in the middle of the seven bowls, it's the voice of Jesus that says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. And blessed, there's the blessing, is the one who stays awake, be ready, and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and shamefully exposed. In other words, the safe weather gear for this storm is to be dressed in Christ's righteousness. Have you clothed yourself by faith through grace, in the righteousness of Christ. 
when I was in college, the signs of the time woke me up. I counted 30, literally 30 false Christs whose posters were up all over Arizona State University campus. Jerusalem at the time was surrounded by armies. That got my attention. I remember reading something in the Bible about that. And I was trapped in my own skin, in my own sin. Though I tried to clean my act up, I mean, I could stop cussing. I could stop being fun to my friends. I could stop using drugs. But what I couldn't get to was the deepest parts of me inside of me. I could not stop hating, and I could not stop lusting. And then so my awareness of of the fact that I was accountable before God and the fact that I wasn't able to pass the test, though I was trying as hard as I could, it took me down, and then it woke me up. I needed help, and I wasn't able to help myself, and God would not leave me alone. He sent people to help me, to help me turn from my way and learn how to go his way, to help me pray, to help me find Jesus through the Bible. And then a new life began. Have you ever had an awakening like that? I don't mean identical to mine. I mean similar in your own experience. To come to know Jesus Are you trusting God in Jesus to forgive your sin? Or are you trapped inside yourself? Maybe you don't realize it because you've never tried to get out. And in rebellion against God, maybe you're even cursing God and blaming him for stuff that's been happening. But unable to change. It's a severe mercy But when the great physician helps you see that the mess the world is in also has its roots in you, that there is a dark abyss in your nature that is holding you captive, it's because he wants to set you free. Here's what Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark it is from within. Out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, greed, adultery, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. This is Jesus. All these evils come from inside and they defile, they pollute a person. So in other words, when sin has its way, Jesus says, you know what? It kills stuff. It kills us in time and in eternity. That's what the vision is saying. And God will not let it keep on destroying his creation forever. It will be judged. It will be removed. But before the final judge makes the final judgment, the same John who saw this vision wrote in his letter, If anybody sins, we have an advocate, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what's the Spirit saying to you? Get real. What would that mean to you? Is it time to get real? What does that mean? That means stop pointing fingers at God. Stop blaming others and God. Stop making excuses for yourself. Get real. Is it time to face the dark abyss in you and and realize that God is making you aware of it because he's trying to get you out of it? He's trying to save you. What would it look like for you to get real about yourself, about admitting the places where you feel trapped 
inside your own skin. Where are you tempted to curse God? Where are you tempted to refuse to repent? This is part of what the reflection is intended to do. Even when your life is falling apart, everything's coming undone all around me, but I'm still not willing to turn to God. Why? Where is evil using your heart as a playground Get real. Is it time to get real about yourself? And then get ready. Don't just get real. Get ready. Get ready. Let Christ help you get ready. Don't wait for the, for the test day before you prepare for the final exam. That doesn't work out in school, does it? Doesn't work out here either. So you can let Christ help. You can let others help. You can let the church help. But get some help. Get Ready. Now, I'm sure that there are extenuating circumstances beyond your control, but here's the question. Are you doing what you can that is within your control to get ready? Are you hearing the warning siren of God? Then it's time to get ready. How can you do that? Well, you can get real. You can be honest. You can stop making excuses. You can ask people that you trust who love you to help you see your blind spots. We all have blind spots. Would you be willing to listen to somebody and let them try to help you see what you don't see yet? You know, when you hear a tornado warning, a tornado siren, what's the smartest thing to do? Get ready. Get to safety. Jesus Christ is God's safe house for us. And he has already been to the abyss of your sin, which means that it's not too much for him. And you can access his freedom in a prayer like this. Lord, I give my sins to you and the Lamb of God who takes them away. Thank you for doing for me what I can't do for myself. My Savior, my Lord, and my God. Maybe the Lord wants you to make a prayer like that. Maybe God just wants you to think about this and sit in it in a posture of humility and curiosity How could this be? Where does this come from? How does that work? What does it mean? Before you say, well, what should I do? Why is God doing all of this? You wondered that? Why doesn't God just bring it all swiftly? If he's going to put an end to it, why didn't he just do it and get it over with? Well, maybe. Maybe he wants you to see that he's giving people time. That he's making the ask and he's offering the invitation and he's giving people time to turn from themselves and turn to him to come to a saving knowledge of faith in Christ before he completes it as only he knows the time can come. But God must be true to himself. And God is holy, God is righteous, God is just. And we are accountable to our maker. And yet God is also redeemer. Our maker wants to redeem us. He is patient. He is kind. He is self-sacrificing. And he is full of love. Daniel Webster of the Webster's English Dictionary said this, the most important thought that ever occupied my mind is that of my individual responsibility to God. You might be having some very important thoughts right now. Isn't this your day to say yes to God and to take God's message to heart? That's where the blessing is. He said those who hear it, those who read it, and those who take it to heart will find the blessing. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear the voice of God, don't harden your heart. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that your spirit will do what only you can do in our hearing, in our responding, in our reflecting, in our engaging, in our struggling. 
I'm so grateful that you did not stop wrestling with me until you had given me opportunity to turn full toward you and freely toward you. And I'm thankful for the change that you are still working in my life. I'm so grateful that you didn't stop working on me, but that you're still committed to freeing me up even more, even more, even more, and that you're willing to speak the truth so that I can find freedom. And I'm praying for somebody today who needs to know your truth so it can set them free. Is it you, brother? Is it you, sister? What is the Spirit is saying to you? Get real. Wake up. Get ready. Return fully to Christ. Turn, perhaps for the first time, fully to Christ. And let Him take away your sins and fill your life with His life. If you would like to do that, then would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, thank you that you made me, that you died to save me so that sin would not kill me in time or eternity. And I now receive the forgiveness by your grace through faith of my sin. And I invite you to come into my life and begin the journey of freedom. And I thank you for hearing my prayer as I make it in Jesus' name. Our heads still bowed just for a moment, but if you prayed that prayer with me and would let me ask God's blessing upon your next steps of faith, would you simply raise your hand where you're seated right now and just hold it up for a moment? If you're joining us online, please click. Let us enter the conversation with you. Yes, I'm opening my life to Jesus and I'm welcoming your prayer of blessing. Thank you here in the front, down toward my right, in the back on my left, several hands. God bless you. Lord Jesus, for every person who by raised hand is saying my heart is wide open and they have welcomed the cleansing of their sins and the filling of your spirit, we pray right now that you would grant them the grace to sense that it is done that it is real and that you will never leave them or forsake them but that as you have started a good work in them you will be faithful to complete it and take us all the way into your presence even through the final day and we're so grateful as we make our prayer in your name Amen